Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and today our guest is Professor Francesca Trivellato. A professor of history at Yale, Professor Trivellato specializes in the social and economic history of Italy, continental Europe, and the Mediterranean in the early modern period. She's the author of a book on Venetian glass manufacturing, and she has also published several essays on craft guilds, women's work, and merchant networks. We are going to talk with her today about her newest book, The Familiarity of Strangers, The Sephardic Diaspora, Livorno, and Cross-Cultural Trade in the Early Modern Period. Welcome, Professor Trivellato. Very nice to be here, Marilyn. Okay, in your newest book, which will be out in May, you look at, uh, you take a new approach to cross-cultural trade. Tell us a little bit about the premise. In a long uh, history of uh, European and Western thought, and to some extent in larger popular imagination, mm -hmm. commerce and toleration often go hand in hand. And historically, it's true that society that have engaged in trade with uh, um, groups of different religious and uh, uh, ethnic uh, background, uh, especially port cities or coastal society, tend to be more upper mobile, uh, more open-minded if we want. But we also know that historically trade has coexisted with war, conquest, with the segregation of merchants group within, uh, uh, for example, within port cities, uh, and uh, with religious prejudice more, more generally. So the premise of, of this book is that in order to trade across religious and ethnic boundaries, merchants need to have some understanding of each other's culture. Uh, at the very least, they need to have a language in common. Sometimes they hire translators, but they need to be able to communicate. They need to have a sense uh, of what legal norms uh, can be used in order to adjudicate potential disputes and how to find recourse in case of fraud. But merchants need not to embrace each other culture you know, fully so that uh, you can trade with somebody if you have enough trust that say they will repay your credit, uh, they will fulfill uh, your orders, they will uh, abide by the promises they make to you. But it doesn't mean uh, if you're a merchant that you want to marry your daughter to them or that you want to invite them to the same place of worship where uh, you go weekly, for example. Okay, and what drew you to this topic? Um, I'm fascinated by how market relations work in different times and in different places. And the history of Europe between around 1500 and 1800, which is the period that historians call the early modern period, um, is particularly fascinating because this is a time when uh, um, European societies became uh, uh, more open, more upper mobile, uh, when certain stigma against merchants uh, become, began to decline in comparison to the previous, say, feudal period. It's also a period when uh, certain uh, religious uh, groups and ethnic uh, diasporas that were heavily involved in trade, including Jews, are given unprecedented rights relatively to, to the time period, in part because of the perceived commercial abilities of these groups. And yet at the same time, European society in this period, in the early modern period, remained very hierarchical and uh, uh, segregation persisted and religious prejudice persisted. So I was interested, first of all, in understanding how cross-cultural trade could work in this context and also what it might mean for the people involved in it. And I say this because we tend to uh, assume that you know Jews traded with Jews, or Quakers traded with trader, excuse me, uh, Quakers traded with Quakers, or Huguenots uh, traded with Huguenots. And on the other hand, some historians and some scholars also in the social sciences tend to assume that for these uh, uh, communities to trade with each other, there need to be a modern uh, legal system that emerges and that adjudicate um, uh, disputes when they arise. But um, the everyday reality of trade, I found, was more complicated. And in fact, uh, 
social and legal forms of enforcement of, um, of uh, commercial obligations tended to coexist. So why Livorno? Why did you choose this city in Italy? And give us an idea of where it's located in, in Italy as well. Livorno is a coastal uh, port city in uh, Tuscany. Mm -hmm. And I was drawn to Livorno by both intellectual and scholarly reason and to some extent by chance. Mm -hmm. And my interest in Livorno has to do with the fact that uh, most European scholarship on early modern global trade focuses on the Atlantic and to some extent on the Indian Ocean. And we tend to forget that the Mediterranean continued to be uh, an important uh, 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 geopolitical and commercial area. And uh, Livorno in particular was a major international hub. Uh, in the late 16th and early 17th century, the Medici Grand Dukes of Tuscany transformed a small village into a large international port city. And Livorno, in fact, has an English version of its name. It's called Leghorn because it was the British outpost in the Mediterranean. There were a number of uh, uh, foreign and uh, religious and ethnic minorities who operated there as merchants. And in particular, which was uh, part of my interest, uh, Livorno was a, had a very large community of Iberian Jews, Sephardic Jews, the descendants of those Jews who had been expelled from Spain in 1492 the largest community of Sephardic Jews in Europe and the New World was in Amsterdam and it's studied, uh, 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 has been studied quite a lot and Livorno has not been studied very much. And when I say that I was also drawn to Livorno by chance is because uh, one of the reasons why Livorno has not been uh, investigated as much as others say, you know, London or, or, or Philadelphia or more well-known uh, port cities is because its archival records uh, are rather poor, part were destroyed in the late 19th century, and then uh, during the um, bombings of World War II, part went into flames. And I came across, by chance, um, I came across a collection of 13,670 business letters that uh, a Jewish partnership in Livorno had written in the early uh, 18th century to a large variety of business agents uh, across Mediterranean, uh, the Mediterranean, Europe, and the Indian Ocean. And as I began to read these letters, I found that um, a considerable number was addressed to Christian, Catholic particularly, merchants, and even to a group of Hindu merchants in, um, in Goa, in which was the capital of Portuguese uh, India at the time. And uh, I thought that was really fascinating, and I was hooked. Mm -hmm. Um, that is very interesting. So let's um, talk a little bit um, in specifics about the research you've done. I imagine you had to travel to Livorno, which I, I imagine was pretty wonderful. Um, what else did you have to do in order to pull the book together? Well, uh, so these uh, uh, um, Jewish merchants who uh, lived and traded, for, lived in Livorno and traded from there, were part of an intercontinental diaspora, and also, as these letters show they had extensive and, and durable commercial relations uh, with the merchant communities uh, very far uh, geographically and culturally from them. So I decided to follow the traces, uh, you know, to follow in the footsteps of these, uh, uh, of these merchants' letters. And um, it was not enough for me to do the research in Tuscany in order to appreciate the global dimension of uh, their commercial activities. Um, in Lisbon, I found a lot of interesting material in the archives of the parish church in which Genoese and, 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 and Florentine merchants, Catholic merchants, who traded regularly with the Jews in Livorno congregated. In Goa, in India, I found uh, some very interesting uh, business letters written by uh, a, a group of Hindu merchants who traded with Europeans regularly and who were able uh, to do so partially because uh, they acquire the etiquette and the standards of business letter writing that also had some legal implications. In Paris and in Marseille, I found a lot of documents that documented the, the activities of the Jews of Livorno in the Mediterranean because uh, in their commercial activities in the Ottoman Empire, the Jews of Livorno were under French diplomatic protection. In London, I found a lot of last wills 
testaments of Jews of Livorno who invested part of their money in the British stock exchange and public debt. In the Netherlands, I found a really interesting lawsuit that then uh, related mm -hmm. to the bankruptcy of the partnership I was working on. And at some point, a colleague of mine in the history department at Yale suggested that I looked at a library in Minnesota where, in fact, there was a cachet of letters that was relevant to my project. So it was a lot of fun, and really I had to uh, try to follow a little bit on the, on the, on the footsteps of these uh, truly global partnerships. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things you found uh, in your research was that business cooperation could coexist um, with mistrust of it, with other social and cultural aspects. Um, explain that phenomenon a little bit. In fact, I think that if we appreciate the technology of trade in this period and the legal, social, and cultural organization of European society in this period, we shouldn't be too surprised by the fact that economic cooperation could go together with religious mistrust. Uh, by technology of trade, I mean that uh, long-distance trade was very risky. This was before the steamship was invented, before the telegraph existed before international tribunal at which you could, uh, ad, you know, uh, ad, that could adjudicate disputes in commercial matters uh, came into existence. Uh, and that is part of the reason why it was often the case that merchants would rely on family members or on co-religionists in order to conduct their business across long distances, not because family members or co-religionists are naturally more you know, competent or more trustworthy, but because it's easier to monitor them and because they have greater incentives to fulfill their commercial obligation. Um, but there's more, and there is that really that co economic cooperation, it's not synonymous with cultural appreciation. So you could find business letters in which, say, a Christian merchant who trades regularly with individual Jewish merchants also includes comments that are derogative and stereotypical about Jews as a collective. Mm -hmm. And what, um, in doing your research, did you find to be most surprising? I was surprised by the extent of the connections that existed between the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean in this period. The items of trade where the Mediterranean red coral was exported to India, where it was highly valued, and it was bartered, exchanged with uh, Indian diamonds and other precious stones. I was surprised uh, by the extent to which the Jews of Livorno were central to this intercontinental trade, and particularly because by this period, very few of them uh, would travel there in person, and so they did not know, they did not have met personally the Hindu traders to whom they entrusted their business, and instead they relied on this uh, very um, highly standardized etiquette of business, write, uh, business letter writing. Um, I was also surprised by the fact that the business partnership on which I focused, uh, the authors of these uh, uh, voluminous correspondence, uh, went bankrupt not because they were let down by one of these distant Hindu agents who they had never met in person, but because they um, at some point entered into an ill-fated uh, business venture with uh, uh, a Persian Jew in the attempt to sell a 60-carat diamond, which is a very large diamond at which they brought first to Versailles at the French uh, King's Court and later tried to sell on uh, the auction market for diamonds in London and Amsterdam, and it turned out the diamond was not of the quality that they had uh, hoped and expected, but also that um, the Iranian Jew with whom they had entered into business was not as reliable as they had anticipated. So I was surprised that the, by the kind of tensions within the broadest uh, uh, world of, of Jewish business that I had investigated. Thank you very much for being with us here today and sharing some of your book with us, The Familiarity of Strangers. For more information about Professor Trivellato and her research, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report.
Be sure to join us again for another episode of the McMillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty McMillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.